at stuff, we're constantly hearing brilliant ideas from inventors and from giant tech companies, but increasingly, we're hearing them from you, which is why we've joined forces with Google to find out if one of you stuff readers out there has what it takes to go from simply having an idea to launching your very own startup company. Welcome to Stuff Launchpad. With a life-changing opportunity up for grabs, we were sent hundreds of great ideas for new technologies and businesses, and we've brought our six favourites here to campus at the heart of London's tech startup scene. Since it was founded two years ago, thousands of entrepreneurs have come to campus to create new technologies, form companies and get investment. And our lucky winner will spend the week getting all the know-how they'll need to begin their very own tech empire. But before pitching their business ideas and ventures to our panel of judges, we caught up with our budding entrepreneurs. I heard about Stuff Launchpad because I read the magazine quite a lot. I've been an avid reader for many years. Uh, I saw the advert and I had an, an idea for an app. And I thought, well, I've had this idea for a while. So I thought this would be the perfect platform to do that. Winning at Stuff Launchpad would provide a perfect opportunity. I never thought I'd ever get the chance of starting my own business. It'd be a real confidence boost, I suppose, to know that industry leaders thought my idea was a good idea. To be able to finally make something of these ideas would be absolutely incredible. And that's a true entrepreneur. It's something that you don't think people want, but actually putting into their everyday life is perfect. So it would just be such an experience to go around and kind of meet these people who've done this before and it would give me steps to, to, to launching my own business and, and becoming the entrepreneur that I kind of want to be. And from there, who knows what we can achieve. Our judges include founders of successful startups, a Google mentor and Stuff's very own editor and they're eager to find out if our entrants have what it takes to start a successful company. We're really interested in the speed at which an idea can become reality. I think it's about going in there with an idea of exactly what you want to come out with at the end, who your audience is and what you need to make it a reality. Google's roots, even now we are a big company, are obviously in the startup world. I think very much from that background, 15 years ago, I haven't been a startup. This is why Google is quite keen to, to help other startups. Beyond my personal preference, I think it's really important that you actually solve a problem. Even in the different mentoring sessions, I've seen startups coming back and changing the idea. Only very, very smart people are able to constantly adapt to a new challenge. So I think it all comes down to the skills of, of, the, of the founder team. Five or six years ago, sort of startup was almost seen as a, something that people do if they couldn't find a job in a large company. Right now, it is actually becoming quite an exciting and uh, kind of interesting place to be. Get ready for valleys of despair. The bad thing is not a failure. The bad thing is how you deal with failure. Winners are going to be the ones that manage to go through them once or twice or maybe even three times and actually emerge on the other side stronger, wiser, but still kind of believing in uh, better. We, we work 24-7, anyone that, as a founder of a company that says any less isn't fully behind the, the calls. If they're not picked, don't take that as a defeat. Just brush yourself down, go out, you know, and have a couple of beers and then crack on. Are your pockets constantly full of receipts? Our first candidate, Ben, says he has a solution. If you go into a store normally and you go, you take all your shopping, you take it to the cashier who scans it out and then you get your receipt. At the end of the transaction, you would get a digital receipt on a board next to the, the cashier. You check it's all there and it's all okay, as one would with a regular paper receipt, and you finish the transaction. At this point, you take a small RFID tagged card individualized to you and you scan it across a reader, which we've had designed, and send all that information to your online repository for you to access later. The supermarkets are currently wasting more than 30 million pounds a year on the paper to produce these receipts, which results in seven and a half million kilos of paper just being wasted every single year. So Ben's feeling pretty confident, but what do our judges think? I like the idea and I see how somebody could buy into it. Let's say one supermarket chain buys into it and then you go to the second chain and then all of a sudden you might run into this conflict. And even in the first place, before you actually think about getting it, the moment you start collecting with a third-party system, which you essentially are, you do get quite a lot of insights. Do you think they will be on board with that? For a supermarket, you need to make it as easy and as frictionless as possible for the end consumer. This additional card that you're mentioning, it's highly unlikely that uh, um, I would be carrying it around. You know, I do have my phone, I do have my keys, and I cut down on all the cards and I only have two right now in my pocket. Adding third one, you know, cost to you, additional sort of hassle to me. Is there an easier, more frictionless way for me to kind of be part of this? Our next candidate is Henry, who wants to build a laptop that helps writers concentrate. 
My pitch is for a modern day typewriter, a tool for writing papers, essays, and creative pieces. Perhaps best pictured as the love child of a Chromebook and a Kindle. My idea then is for something like a laptop, but with purposefully limited functionality, designed with the specific function of writing long text in mind. Henry's e-typewriter is a smart idea, but is it too niche for our judges? I think on the one hand it's quite interesting, mm -hmm. even if it's for a niche market, it might yeah. be interesting for that yeah. niche market. Right. On the other hand, I, I don't think it solves the problem because, yeah, I have a tablet, I have a Kindle, I have a laptop, mm -hmm. I have a phone and so on. So if I have another device, this is really going to make me more yeah. efficient. I mean, maybe this is something that's kind of worth pitching to yeah. Amazon as an extension of the, the Kindle range. Next up, it's Jill, who has a bright idea that's been inspired by her grand. Basically, g to g is a social network for the over 65s, where they can go and connect with each other. It's a social platform that's been developed to try and help end loneliness among the over 65s as it's an increasing problem. So it would be like an online website where people over 65 could directly like, log in and subscribe themselves or where um, connectors, so like people in like my generation, like Generation Y, could introduce their grandmas to each other. So perhaps it could be a plug-in through social media or they could just go in and fill in a profile about their grandmas and then connect each other. Our judges like Jill's socially responsible idea, but is there room for yet another social network? I think Facebook is perhaps is a little complex. It'd be interesting to know kind of what you were proposing with this that would really differentiate it from Facebook. Telling them use a social network for the people in that generation, it seems very, very abstract. But telling them, hey, press this button and you're going to see your grandchildren, or press this button and you see the pictures they sent to you over the last couple of days, that's interesting to them. Now, have you ever wished your favourite restaurant would deliver to your door? Well, that could soon be a reality thanks to our next contestant, David. I'm here today to talk to you about a little concept delivery app called a Porter. It aims to provide a community of Deliverers. These guys could be seeking an extra income. These guys can be people like myself and yourself, and they're willing to pick up anything whenever you want and whenever you want. And also, they can use any mode of transportation they wish to. So, you can have like a cyclist courier, or you can have a guy on a Vespa, or someone with a car. But it kind of works like the Halo app, where you can obviously see the availability of the cyclists around your area. They can obviously set their own rates as well, so that you can encourage a competition between different deliverers. And also the dream is to have a porter as a service on people's websites to deliver with a porter on there. So you can order something and quickly click on the website to see if there's anyone around to deliver it. David's idea sounds tasty, but would our judges let an amateur driver deliver their dinner? I like that you've got a clear idea of targeting certain outlets to tie it to, rather than just saying, here's a free for all just anyone pick up anything from anywhere. You're talking about verification of the deliverance guys. I've, you know, get past that point, deliver well, and uh, it's, a, it's a service that you want to get. Next up, it's Adrian, a doctor who says he can improve the way medical students learn. My name is Adrian Chiang. I'm a junior doctor working up in Yorkshire at the moment. And my idea, in a nutshell, is basically an educational utility app which I want to turn into a sort of game to make it really interesting for people to use and actually make them feel like they're not really learning at all. And this idea is all about making sure you can actually learn the process, feel the process, and then practice it for real with as little a gap in that transition as possible. So to start off with, you'd have a standard menu, and the whole idea is the gamification of education. What I want to do is to give people opportunities to learn the different conditions in a way that they've never done this before. If we enter the ward, you have your demo patient, now, this is your voodoo doll, as it were, and these circles are the hot spots. As a doctor, you need to go through a very systematic approach to examining your patients. So if we started off, for example, with the fingertips, something which, you know, you take for granted, just you notice how your fingers go white and then they, they go pink again. If you go to the wrist, that's where you feel the heart rate. For example, it might say, press here, and the moment you put your finger on that spot there, the tablet might vibrate to a certain pulse at a certain rate. It doesn't tell you what the numbers are, you're not reading it, you're actually picking it up from the, the haptic response. And as you go along, you can go up, go up to the chest, you can put sound bits in at different parts of the chest. When you touch those different areas, you actually hear those sounds that tell you different things about what's going on with each of these patients. Then you choose what tests you want to do. Lots of different tests, it might mean absolutely nothing to you, but the whole point is that it gives the user the freedom to choose what they want to do. They may choose the wrong thing, but being wrong is part of learning. 
you make a mistake, later you might get a message back saying that wasn't necessary. But you remember that because you made that mistake and you learn from your mistakes. But obviously we can't do that on real people, so why don't we have the simulation for it instead? Adrian's already at the prototype stage, but what do our judges make of it? Uh, personally, it, it amazed me and uh, I think to the point that I find it incredible that it's not been done before. It seems it should exist. If it doesn't, then, you know, somebody needs to <laughs> create it as quickly as possible because uh, I agree with you that not everyone is at their best when they read. This seems like a genius thing to be doing and, you know, you study medicine, fantastic, but I can see it being applicable in a lot of other areas. Uh, my fiance is a doctor. She complained about having to read too much and too many, too, too little extra like exercise in that sense mm -hmm. all the time. So there's definitely a huge gap between the traditional way of teaching it and the kind of practical way of you know being on the job. Yeah. I'm I'm a big fan of gamification. Uh, I didn't really see the gamification here, okay. uh, but that's fine, right? I mean, yeah. It's not as a criticism, but it's definitely something you can build up on. I think the challenge you will have, a positive challenge, is hitting the right level of it being very scientific because you want it to be a credible source of uh, learning to become an actual doctor, not just playing or yeah. you know, pretending to be a doctor, and making a, a gamification thing where it's actually kind of fun to do it, right? So yeah. where you always kind of want to do it even when you're not studying, just because you enjoy doing it, because you have an interest in it. Thing is, for me, I've always wanted to play guitar. Looks like now I'm going to be a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> With our judges loving Adrian's pitch, it's now up to Justin, our final Launchpad contestant, to make an impression with his idea for minimising food waste. My idea is actually based on uh, a digital app which allows you to search specific locations for reduced items, food items food that's going off in the next 24 hours, and I'm calling it True Foodie. How does this fit into the bigger picture? Globally, there are increasing levels of food poverty and various news stories. For example, council spent nearly £3 million on public money over the two years feeding people. Tesco's, in the first six months of 2013, created 30,000 tonnes of waste. That's just Tesco's alone. Uh, True Foodie doesn't have to be limited to supermarkets. It can be applied to any shop that sells perishable goods. So you can apply it to delicatessens, butchers, grocers, anything that has a perishable goods. And the revenue stream would come from supermarkets would be charged advertising, whereas the suppliers like the butchers and your grocers and your delicatessens would you'd be able to purchase the items on your app. As you go, you search for, for example, I want to buy uh, a cream eclair. You can buy it on your app and go and pick it, uh, go and pick it up. Um, and that's how you take 10% uh, commission from that. And the store would have to throw it away anyway. So it's beneficial for both parties. At least they get some money for it. It's a bold idea that looks at an important problem, but does Justin have the know-how to make it happen? My wife would love this. And so would the millions of people that go on Money Saving Expert and all those kinds of websites. I think that positioning it as a let's reduce waste and let's kind of do something to the environment is uh, a lot bigger idea as you know that I see. I would have your app and if it popped up I might not want potatoes but if it popped up and there's potatoes there I might think hmm, you know maybe I can do a shepherd's pie for two days and freeze one. You'd be looking into making a lot of data connections and you'd be looking into like getting a lot of data into real time uh, pink both ways. That's definitely possible. Um, it will depend a lot on who you're working with and however their technical setup is. But I, I really, I mean, I don't see why you shouldn't be able to like tackle at least part of that problem with whatever you come up with. With six excellent pitches to deliberate over, it's now time for our judges to decide which business idea will get the Stuff Launchpad seal of approval. Like you say, I think it would take very little to get that to, to snowball. She was aware of how to like go to the next step and actually make it happen. Who do we think of them is best suited to actually get to that stage? That's what I kept like asking myself. I mean, to, I mean, to, to me personally, it feels like a very a solution to a very minor problem. I think from the discussion, it became quite clear that each of that individual idea, like all of these ideas, actually deserve to be like continued and thought through and actually yeah. tried in even more detail, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think what we've come up with today is, <laughs> is six going across the line, like you saying, bolt together. We have to pick one. Each of our judges have heard the pitches, and I can finally reveal that the winner of Stuff Launchpad is...
Adrian and Digital Diagnosis. Ooh. Winning stuff, Launchpad. Actually, it really means everything. I've put a lot of thought into this whole process from the beginning. Other people seem to be convinced by it, but I guess like being able to win something like this, it just proves that there is a market for this idea. If I can be the start of something that changes the way we do things, then that in itself is a huge reward. All I can say is, let's make learning fun. Well, that's it. It's over. And we've come to the end of our Stuff Launchpad search. Adrian and his digital diagnosis app have been crowned our winner. And he'll be spending the week here at Campus London to indulge in a startup masterclass and mentorship from some of Google's finest. Let's just hope he doesn't forget about us when he becomes a billionaire. And for more on Stuff Launchpad and to see all individual pitches, head on over to Stuff.tv for the full story.